Hey, bud. What are you doing here? Is your mama Crystal missing? Oh, she's not missing. I know exactly where Crystal is. She's with me being entertained. You'll get her back first. I want to play a game. No. I put a stop to this. There, there can't be another one of you! The game is still Life 2 on PC, and you have some homework to do. So, I should tend to Crystal while you get busy. Okay, you're gonna have to follow me down a rabbit hole because Still Life 2 is actually the third installment of a trilogy that I had never even heard of before. And it all begins with a 2002 game called Post Mortem. Post Mortem is a point and click adventure game where you play as Gus McPherson, a private eye slash artist in 1920s Paris who's hired to investigate the murders of two American tourists. He's haunted by visions of death and the investigation leads to a secret cult of the Knights Templar where any number of the city's elite may be involved. It's a macabre story where the mystical elements are sprinkled gradually enough that the game doesn't feel like it's ever jumping the shark and every new reveal of what's really going on still feels like a major event with proper weight to it. What little soundtrack the game has is atmospheric and the visual design of the environments is impressively detailed and at times even gothic. Dialogue trees are crucial not just for collecting evidence, but for making sure you don't piss off a witness and make more work for yourself. The game is far from perfect. The voice acting is not exactly Oscar caliber. I don't get it. I've never worked for you before. Not here nor in New York. Yet you come to me and ask me to find your sister's murderer. The game is structured to where you can get hopelessly screwed by missing a single clickable item hidden in massive full 360 degree rooms and you will not get a hint of what you're missing or where it is. But the game was a micro budgeted release made by a crew of only 27 people so it's still pretty impressive what they managed to accomplish. The big problem with Postmortem is that it's just clunky to play. Thrilling as it can be investigating a new area for fresh clues, and as different and innovative as the interface is, you still have to slowly sweep your cursor over a lot of screens to make sure you aren't missing anything clickable. I think over half the inventory items aren't even used. You can find a camera at the start of the game, and I didn't use the damn thing once! There's a puzzle late in the game where you just look up three combinations in a history book Except that book is sandwiched between two other books that you can't open. And I swear I tried flipping through all my documents and the book wasn't there, so I needed to consult a walkthrough for one of the game's easiest puzzles. Just because the inventory is so cluttered and unorganized. And trust me, the game's puzzles can get brutal. There's something to be said for a game that doesn't hold your hand, but when you're faced with a lock-picking puzzle where you jam in picks into random spots and no matter what you do they just jiggle endlessly, there's also something to be said for, I don't even know what I'm looking at. I think the most infamous puzzle in the game is when you need to make a sketch of the prime suspect using eyewitness accounts, except the descriptions are so generic that it's pure guesswork with no idea what you're doing wrong. I followed the directions and got two out of eight features correct, and that's only because no glasses and square jaw were gimmies. I started to wonder if I just suck at the game, but then I used a walkthrough to get through another locked door, and the answer was, a hammer has magically teleported on the floor off the beaten path next to a door that has done nothing all game. Yeah, no, it's the game! I got utterly stuck on the game's third act because I missed two vital clickable items in the psychiatrist's office, which, fine, that one's on me. I missed a hidden key in one of the victim's apartments, which, screw you, that shit was invisible! A puzzle wouldn't interact properly because you're supposed to piss off a witness to get a vital clue, and there's an alchemy puzzle that might as well have been written in Klingon. You need to explore the secret lab, find four tables of numbers, figure out that each table condenses down to one number, match each number to an element, then leave this area to explore the rest of the house, find what look like hidden paintings matching each element to an astrological symbol, match those symbols and numbers to potion ingredients, and notice minuscule numbers written on some spoons to precisely measure out each ingredient. And literally the entire payoff to this puzzle is an inventory item that I didn't even use! And the book puzzle that triggers the end game has no means of figuring out its solution. You get three letters out of order from how they're listed on the left, and then you just monkey with the dials until the puzzle solves itself. I am not kidding, that's how it works. What the hell? Alright, so Postmortem had a really good story, good atmosphere, and fantastic visual design, 
but sporadic puzzle designs and clunky gameplay. But low-budget games don't have to go far to be successful, so in 2005 we got a sequel to the game called Still Life. In Still Life, you play as Victoria McPherson, Gus's granddaughter who's an FBI agent in modern Chicago. She's tracking a masked serial killer who's escalating and evolving his killings, and she discovers that it may be tied to a case that Gus worked in Prague 80 years prior, leading to a dual timeline story where you investigate potentially linked killers in both the 1920s and the 2000s. Still Life is good. The mystery story is very compelling and unique with its timeline element. The characters are a lot of fun, especially our snark machine lead, Victoria. The game has fun with the contrast between modern CSI investigations and old noir detective methods, and the gameplay has been drastically streamlined from its predecessor. No more getting screwed because you missed a pickup in a huge area, no more deluge of useless inventory items, and no more puzzles that are completely unexplained. With one exception. You need to translate numbers into gibberish symbols with no clues how it works, and you're meant to guess it's the number of angles. What? And I absolutely adore the gritty, dark art style and ominous soundtrack, making the game very atmospheric and pumping on the menace and suspense every time you're close to a major discovery or plot point. The game isn't a masterpiece by any means, and it can get a little too linear at times. Stretches where you just run around talking to people, and it's so obvious where to go that the game kind of plays itself for a bit. I did consult walkthroughs every now and then, more out of impatience than necessity, but I still call bullshit on the final chapter when two game-critical items are minuscule and near impossible to spot. But the game is usually pretty good about giving you hints in a recap diary if you're stuck, and every single conversation is written down so you don't forget any vital clues or have to take notes. One of the more stimulating, yet potentially unfair puzzles in the game is the baking puzzle where you translate the code words in a recipe into actual ingredients by using real-world knowledge of how cookie recipes are written. I loved it because I do a lot of cooking, but if you don't bake, well, you're up shit creek. And the reason you absolutely need to solve this puzzle? So Victoria's dad can have some cookies before she goes back to work. Right. Honestly, the only big problem with Still Life is its open ending. We save the final victim, and the game ends! We don't actually stop the killer or learn his identity. The game just cuts off with a link to a website saying, THE ADVENTURE CONTINUES! Said website is long dead, and the Wayback Machine says that it was just a basic marketing site. It's like the devil inside all over again. Only, you know, still life was actually good. Microids, the developer, did eventually churn out a sequel to conclude the story with Still Life 2, released four years later in 2019. Unfortunately, Microids made two critical mistakes with their multi-part narrative-driven experience. Rule number one, don't change writers for part two! And rule number two, don't change writers to someone who thinks your franchise is stupid! In still life, Gus in the past tracks a serial killer in Prague who's preying on prostitutes and discovers they're all connected to a local artist, Mark Ackerman, whose powerful father is covering up the murders. Mark gets away and starts art murdering again in Chicago, but he's caught so hard that even daddy's money can't stop a life sentence in Arkham Asylum. Similar murders then begin years later in Los Angeles with the cops approaching Gus to look for a connection. In modern day, Victoria's boyfriend Richard runs an art gallery showcasing Mark's artwork, and she realizes that her killer is recreating Mark's murder art. And the paintings hint that Mark had an apprentice before he passed on, suggesting an entire lineage or cult of killers in his image. In addition, all the victims are connected to a culty sex club called the Red Lantern, which stretches to powerful people throughout the city. Victoria makes the connection in time to save the hot lesbian bondage dominatrix, but the killer gets away and Victoria quits the FBI to head to Los Angeles to investigate the first apprentice and begin unraveling the year-spanning conspiracy. That's the plot that we're working with, powerful cult of serial killers winding through time to the present day. Let's see what part two does with it. Still Life 2 opens with Victoria reading articles that Mark and his pupil both died immediately and Mark has a grandchild named Richard and her boyfriend is the killer. And then the game jumps forward three years to where Victoria's an FBI agent again, and she's in Maine tracking a completely different serial killer! Cheese and rice, I think this game set a new land speed record, dumping its setup as fast as possible. Within 15 minutes of booting up part two, it has thrown out the entire story of part one to start a new plotline. 
It is ungodly jarring! Okay, first of all, gotta love how Victoria immediately realizes that it's her Richard who's the killer because no two people in any universe can share a first name. Okay, to be fair, Richard was my prime suspect for part one. Mark was an obscure nobody that no one else knew about. Dating an agent is kind of an explanation for how he breaks into the FBI early on. And one of the murders happened in his own gallery, but the explanation that we get is rock stupid. We eventually find out that his actual motivation is that his art career didn't take off. So might as well take up hooker murder like his grandpappy. That whole sex cult that we uncovered that connected the victims and even implicated the FBI director? None of that connects back to Richard. So we spent the whole first game on a wild goose chase cosmic coincidence that didn't have squat to do with anything. This is what I meant by don't hire a writer who thinks your series is stupid. This is like if you made IT Chapter 2, where the heroes have to return to their hometown and stop Pennywise once and for all, but Pennywise died off screen 10 minutes in and they spent the rest of the movie fighting the Predator. It doesn't work! And even without context, the game's opening is a mess. You get minutes on end of hilariously clunky dialogue recapping the first game, then you're given mountains of text to read, then you have several more minutes of blunt force exposition setting up the new story. It's like watching Turkish Star Wars. Your brain is fried and you haven't even started yet. Anyway, the game's actual story is that Victoria is in Maine investigating the East Coast Killer. And shit hits the fan when Paloma Hernandez, a reporter that's horning in on the investigation, is captured by the killer. So now the dual storyline is split between Victoria trying to find the killer and Paloma trying to escape him. Yeah, Gus McPherson, the main hero of both prior games, is completely absent from part three, but I have another bone to pick with these games. Still life's killers were called the Chicago Ripper, the LA Ripper, and the Perlovka Ripper, and the new supervillain is the astonishingly generic, the East Coast Killer. You people suck at names! The game's controls are completely horrid. Everything is still controlled with a mouse like the other installments, but now you have to explore environments by clicking around to move your character. As you move, the camera awkwardly swerves until eventually the game switches between four or five different camera angles for every damn room. Basically, if you want to be able to actually find anything, you have to tediously click around every single environment, slowly walking in circles in the hope that eventually the camera turns where you need to go. And there are many, many sections of the game where you need to try and force the camera to shift into the one angle where you can click on a door or something else important to proceed, so you have to keep clicking until the game's horrid pathfinding finally has the character step to where you need them to go and hope that they don't then misread a click and then backtrack! No, don't turn around, you stupid bitch! So now there are a ton of literal extra steps to basic navigation and exploration, regressing to the first game where it takes forever to look for items and explore locations, as you have to slowly drag your ass over every inch of the environment while sweeping your mouse cursor trying to find anything that's interactive. Oh, and the absolute kiss of death for puzzle-driven adventure games like this? You have a size limit to your inventory. You have an inventory with 16 slots, except most of the game's items take up more than one space. Those 16 slots are more like six. To manage your inventory, there are cabinets and etc. throughout the levels to store what you don't need to free up space. So it adds a pointless commute to further pad out the game's puzzles, and the cabinets aren't linked, so you'd better remember where you put all your shit. Honestly, between the fixed camera system and the pointless inventory storage boxes, I wonder if someone was actively trying to ape Resident Evil in a puzzle adventure game. Especially since the new inventory system has slots for a weapon when there hasn't been combat of any kind in either of these games. This bloated ass, needlessly convoluted interface makes the entire game a frustrating and tedious chore to actually play. The environments and soundtrack have lost any engrossing atmosphere that the previous installments had. Everything feels like a giant step backwards, not only from the last game, but even from the primitive, micro-budgeted original. Oh, and it's not a good sign that one of the first things I saw was Victoria's model glitching to where she's turned 90 degrees in the wrong direction. 
She's operating her computer with her ass! Huh. The game's literally bugged out the butt. Hernandez wakes up in a bedroom with a shock collar, preventing her from leaving. You need to rip out some electrical wiring from the TV, pry the panel off a gateway that works the collar, connect the wiring to an exposed board, use a rod to turn on the electricity, pry the boards off the window with a fire poker, because a poker is the same thing as a crowbar, apparently, and then throw the mattress out the window so that she can jump out onto it. It's not the most convoluted escape room puzzle, Except nothing in this room friggin' works until after you've clicked on it two or three times! Seriously, you'll click an item, Hernandez will just say what it is and walk away, and it's only if you go back and click it one or two more times, or click it after doing something else completely unrelated, that you find out it's an actual interactive puzzle mechanic. The player's brain doesn't work this way. If you click on something and it does nothing, you move on! Just for an example, I figured out that you're supposed to use a nail file to undo some screws on this panel, but it doesn't work, because you first have to click on the panel so that Hernandez can point out that it needs unscrewing. And only then does the basic puzzle work correctly! Can you see how confusing this gets? Hernandez gets a call out to Victoria to tell her where she is, but the killer catches her. So now we cut back to Victoria, poking around Hernandez's hotel room looking for clues. Victoria's not solving puzzles, though. Instead, she's told to sweep the room for clues with a CSI kit that can scan and collect samples and analyze, identify, and research DNA and chemicals and cross-reference scans with the FBI database on the spot within seconds. Friggin' Batman wishes he had detective gadgets this strong, but... Whatever! You might think you're out of the woods since Victoria doesn't have to solve puzzles, she just has to walk around clicking on everything to collect evidence, but that's the problem. You don't get to leave this level until you've found every single scrap of evidence, including invisible fiber stuck to the door and a remote half tucked under the bed that's so close to another item I couldn't tell there was more than one clickable thing here because the game is so abysmally laid out that key items will have their hitboxes overlap. And then I needed a walkthrough to tell me that you can move files from your phone into the CSI kit, which is never hinted to you. Sure, I could have read that in the CSI kit's instructions, if I could figure out how to advance them past the first page. Why is this game's interface so convoluted? It's worth mentioning at this point that the game has a hint system that I turned on right away from the options. The hint system is completely useless. Unless I'm missing what it does, it only ever seems to give you the very first step to a given vague overall objective. Every time I tried it, it just told me to do the obvious thing that I already did 20 minutes ago. We cut to Hernandez locked in what looks like a filthy abandoned bathroom with a severed hand in the corner. She has to explore the room for an antidote to an injected poison out of four fake antidotes that'll kill her faster. And she has to find ways to cross a broken glass floor and disarm a lethal shock collar, and she's put into a trap where she has to strap herself into an electric chair and electrocute herself at a precise voltage so as not to kill herself. And now we've reached the point where you can probably piece together what this game's deal is. Still Life 2 really badly wants to be part of a movie franchise. Can you guess which one? Let's count down the clues. There are two storylines, one about the cops chasing a killer and one about victims trying to survive the killer. The killer abducts people to lock them in abandoned locales like a house wired with poison gas or a derelict bathroom with a severed limb. The killer forces his victims to go through escape room like setups and deadly puzzles like figuring out the correct antidote or finding codes and death traps where they have to grievously injure themselves to escape. The killer's traps have a message about people or society that they're disgusted with, in this case the prison system. The killer modulates their voice and intentionally leaves bodies and clues for the cops to find, talks to victims via intercoms and cameras. Do you get it yet or do I need a puppet riding a tricycle to really spell it out for ya? THIS IS FUCKING SAW! They threw out the plot of the last game to have you fight a clone of Jigsaw, and they've completely given up being subtle about it. The game was in development from 2005 to 2009, the peak of the Saw franchise's popularity, except the key difference is that Saw is, you know, interesting. 
John Kramer is a fascinating horror icon because he has a code. He thinks that by making people fight for their lives, they will appreciate said lives and right whatever wrongs that they've done. His golden rule is that every game has a chance of survival, even if it's a remote chance. He's also got a tragic backstory that makes him a fascinating character and lends you in on why he does what he does. The East Coast Killer, meanwhile, is just an asshole who tortures people until he's bored and then kills them just for the hell of it. And that's before you get to his petty, stupid-ass motive. But whatever, back to the stupid puzzles. Where I had to look up that you use a fire extinguisher to short out a fuse box, but that somehow doesn't actually break said fuse box. Whatever! The point where I officially gave up all hope of solving the game's puzzles on my own was the morgue puzzle. You find some anonymous marker powder and are just supposed to instinctively know to mix it with water, and then you spray that mixed water on a wall to reveal some buttons. You get no hints other than the wall being interactive. This triggers a timer where you have to escape the room before poison gas floods in, and all you have to work with are a keypad, three morgue doors that are unmarked and locked, an autopsy table, and a butcher's diagram. Want to know what you do? You enter three codes into the keypad, and you get the combinations from the dates of the flavor text background information clips that just happened to be on Hernandez's tape recorder. And the only even remotely vague clue that you're given is the killer mocking you that time flies, which any sane person would have interpreted as a joke about the timer. Am I the idiot here? How the hell was anyone supposed to figure that out? Oh, and the killer whines that he can't kill me because I disarmed the shock collar as I stand in a room wired with poison gas. Nitwit. Hernandez gets knocked out by a stun grenade, and then we cut back to Victoria investigating the murder house with her partner, Garris, and a local sheriff. Garris, by the way, has a messed up face because they screwed up the shine on his skin textures and I could never remember his name, so I'm just gonna call him Tony Todd. An old decrepit house in the forest. You'd think we were in a horror movie. Yeah! Specifically, this horror movie! And now we have to traipse over the entirety of this big-ass house, checking every single nook and cranny for anything tucked anywhere that's interactive. Wandering around talking to people every time we hit a dead end, and not allowed to leave until you've found every single clickable item in the whole damn house. Yeah, still Life 2's problems go way deeper than just the storyline because this is abysmal, spiteful game design right here. You are dumped into a massive environment to look for dozens of clickable items given no clear marks of what's interactive and what's not unless you mouse over everything five times Loads of hotspots are invisible because they're tiny smudges or debris on the floor, and you can't leave until you find every last scrap of interactivity like the world's worst scavenger hunt. And just to add insult to injury, well over half the crap that you find just tells you things that you already know. So not only is the gameplay pure garbage, but I can tell that you're wasting my time. I do not need 50 clues all spelling out that the other victims were also killed in this house. I do not need a dozen clues that the sheriff is running her own investigation behind my back. Maybe someone else found all the crap that Hernandez did in the last level, so I don't have to rehash the entire chapter. Like, I was disappointed that the first still life had a cool CSI procedural puzzle at the very start and then never touched the concept again. But cheese and rice! If this is the alternative, I didn't know how good I had it! And that's another thing, maybe you want to defend the game saying it's real high on being some kind of realistic CSI simulator. Except real world investigators are specially trained, don't have to process an entire mansion solo, they aren't locked down with a hideously restrictive interface for what they can do and touch, and an actual investigator wouldn't have to solve puzzles to get a flashlight and a basic INTERNET SEARCH! Oh, and at one point in this level, a snake just jumps out and bites you. In a cutscene where they completely forgot to add any sound. You have to find the antidote in a time limit, and your only clue is that it's hidden in a cool place. Which apparently is code for the medicine cabinet in the bathroom upstairs. 
Someone want to unravel that logic for me? And man, all these death timers are getting on my nerves. Another weird thing that happens in this level, you find clues that Hernandez has gone through at least three more torture games involving a terrarium, an operating table, and an altercation in the kitchen. None of these are shown or referenced ever again. Like, three whole levels were cut for time. How does a game that had four years to bake feel so ungodly rushed? I spent over an hour and a half exploring this damn house, picking up clues before just turning to a walkthrough to tick down the shit that I missed. I missed two footprints that are borderline invisible and stashed in hotspots with other clues. I missed a cable on top of a cabinet that the camera never shows you. I missed a license plate covered in mud to where you can't tell anything's there. And in the room where Victoria bitches that she can't interact with anything because it's too dark. I missed the one thing that you can interact with. An oil lamp hanging on the wall that I couldn't see. For crap's sake. Lamp oil. Rope. Bombs. Anyway, they turn up a name for the killer, Victor Carson, and they find out he's a film student obsessed with movies from the 40s. So, the killer is the cinema snob? They call in Victoria's former partner, James Hawker, because they have reason to suspect he's on the killer's hit list. Oh yeah, bring the serial killer's prime target to the serial killer's own house while he's still at large. Brilliant! Hawker was fired from the FBI for killing a suspect, has been sharing inside information with Hernandez, and given that the killer told Hernandez earlier that Hawker was already captured in a death trap... Yeah, he's in on it. The next stretch of gameplay is blessedly simple. You just run around talking to people to fix a console upstairs and a computer downstairs. Simple enough, except for two problems. For one, you have to call your lab technician friend completely unprompted for no reason, or the level doesn't work. And for two, the game soft locks if you do the steps out of order. I sent Tony Todd to work on the console, got totally not evil Hawker fixing the PC. Gee, what are the odds that he guessed the killer's password right away? I printed off the manual that Tony Todd needs, and the game locked on a black screen. This happens every single time that I try to go upstairs and there's no other way up. This save has been rendered unwinnable. Luckily, the game always drops an autosave at the start of a new chapter, which I'm now fairly sure was a cheap catch-all for these Game Breaker bugs. Okay, plan B. I searched the console, but I didn't tell Tony Todd about it, and I can no longer click on anything the game has soft-locked again. Okay, flat-out friggin' ignore the console, do all the shit with the computer first, then go outside and get Tony Todd- Oh, thank crap, the game's finally working. Victoria figures out there's an underground bunker with prison cells, but before she can explore it, all the cops are slaughtered off-screen by the killer. Gee, cops getting slaughtered like brain-dead morons by the killer going god mode. Not a thing like Saw the Final Chapter, which came out a year after the game did. It's like recursive ripping off. Yeah, just stand out in the open to get shot by the sniper, Victoria. Dumb cops are another staple of the Saw franchise. So now Victoria and Hernandez are both captured, but Hernandez frees them both with some basic puzzle work and a batshit puzzle where you translate letters into numbers by assuming the letters of the alphabet convert into the numbers 0 through 9, cycling repeatedly, even though the keypad has letters on it. Now Victoria has to get back into the house to use the killer's computer, but he's booby-trapped the house with mines, tripwires, and... The cutscene doesn't even show you what one of the traps is. To get around the mines, you have to use the metal detector to find out where our mine is, and then either avoid the mines or find an item to lay over each one so they don't explode. Just one slight problem. It doesn't work! The game will only let me disarm one of the mines before Victoria starts bitching at me that the item whose sole function is to go here doesn't go here. And even if you know where all the mines are and you try to step around them, the game's pathfinding is such garbage that I can promise you'll still set them off by accident. And then you disable an electric fence by finding some lock-picking tools. 
Which would have been easier if the game didn't just abruptly decide to change how the metal detector works for no damn reason on just this one item! I just... We've reached the point where the puzzles are completely breaking down, not working it. Oh my god, you stupid bitch! I clicked the scan icon to detect the mine, not STEP ON IT! Then there's a laser trap that makes no friggin' sense. Sometimes walking through a laser kills you, and sometimes it doesn't, and there's no distinction whatsoever for what the different colors of lasers actually do. Even in-universe, they say that this trap went unfinished, so I think the devs just fudged it. You even find two different pocket knives that both do the exact same thing they were rushing so hard by this point. You re-rig the electrical trap to kill the murderer, and he's... just some guy. Yeah, but then you get a picture of your actual suspect, David Carson, and find out he's the other prisoner in the bunker, meaning that he's got Hernandez. Victoria really should have called that. For one, he gave us the name of someone we had strong evidence is already dead. And for two, he's got photos of himself doing the killing on the back wall in plain sight! Most of the game from this point is basic inventory puzzles as you run around collecting items, figuring out where they go, and backtracking endlessly to and from storage cabinets to hassle with the damn limited inventory. Seriously, whose bright idea was it to... Whoa! Victoria got stuck between walls of the environment, and now I can't move. Well, thank crap I had literally just saved my game. Still life. Video game. Weird. The lead character looks like me. Wow. Okay, I know that's just supposed to be a cute Easter egg, but is that supposed to cover for why we're completely ignoring the story of the last game? Because the last still life is a video game in this universe? That just raises further questions! Although it would explain how Victoria went from being an entertaining and funny wisecracking firecracker in the last game to having the personality of Mopey Dishwater in the second. I think the game's writers even hated the character's name, since everyone calls her Vic now for no damn reason. You get a key to more of the underground bunker, finally a new location after umpteen hours of this damn house, and you find Hawker's hanged body, but it's actually Tony Todd dressed to look like him. Don't feel bad, Tony, Todd, and Death are good friends. He just got reassigned to make another Final Destination movie. And somehow, the fact that the killer faked Hawker's death for him still doesn't clue in Victoria that he's evil. You find Carson about to kill Hernandez. Victoria keeps him talking while Hernandez frees herself. Except the damn game shit piss navigation got her stuck on the terrain until time ran out. Dumbass! Hernandez runs to the killer's lab, and Victoria goes to help. My first instinct was to go to where the killer is shown to be and shoot him in the face, but a door is abruptly sealed so that that doesn't work. Instead, you use the computer to open a door that does nothing, and that advances the game... somehow. Hawker eventually just shows up and kills Carson and openly abducts Hernandez on camera. He settled the score with Carson. Maybe everything's gonna be okay. Oh my god, Vicky, even Saw's detectives would have figured this out by now. Oh hey, forensic evidence that Hawker's gun was also used to kill Tony Todd. Have you pieced it together yet, Vicky? I've got to talk to Hawker. How are you an FBI agent? Hawker has to directly spell it out by posing on a security camera as the killer before the stupid bitch figures it out. Also, funny story, there's a bug that renders this part of the game unsolvable and the game unwinnable. You're supposed to get a key password from the killer's mask, but it won't be there if you don't check the printer, and the printer will randomly glitch to be non-interactive. The game's website had to have a downloadable save file to bypass this section, and that website is gone, so... Fail. So yeah, Hawker is the killer. He's pissed that the FBI wouldn't let him just shoot all his suspects sight unseen, so now he's decided that law doesn't work and that's why he started killing hookers? Like, if you're mad that you think the law doesn't work, you become the Punisher, not the Ice Truck Killer. 
The East Coast Killers tried to go after Hawker, but he joined them instead because he figured it would somehow let him get revenge on Victoria for not helping him keep his job. And yes, a vigilante cop who's caught by the killers but starts working with them, poses as the killer's victim to throw off suspicion, and takes over as the main villain, is exactly Hoffman's story from the Saw movies! And cripes, even the names Hawker and Hoffman kinda sound alike. Anyway, Victoria tries to go to save Hernandez, but she gets caught in a flamethrower trap because Hawker knows that she hates fire. And now we have a flashback explaining why. There have been a few points where the game flashed back to Victoria confronting Richard about how he was the killer from the last game, and all he has to say for himself is to ramble like a drunk hippie about how murder's awesome, man. There's a fight, and Richard's studio catches fire, and Richard gets cuffed and just walks into the fire to off himself. Now I'm going to wonder for the rest of my days if the Gotham by Gaslight movie was specifically copying this game. There's a brief puzzle where you need to escape the fire by wetting a blanket to get a pole, using the pole to open a window, and making a grappling hook to reach the window. The problem is the game's camera continues to be horrid. You cannot interact with or even see the critical window unless you walk into the furthest back corner of the room that you can barely reach, so a simple puzzle is made into a giant pain in the ass. And Victoria needed this flashback to remind her to... just time the flamethrowers so that she can escape. Right. You know, you could also just crawl under the flamethrowers instead of having animations where she keeps walking directly into the fire the rest of the game. Shitloads of running to and from a storage cabinet to juggle inventory items so that a two-minute task takes over half an hour later! Victoria catches Hawker making a bomb, but somehow fails to shoot him, and you use the bomb to blow open where Hernandez is being held. Finally, you use that gun that's been specially marked in your inventory all game for a shootout with Hawker. And even though Victoria knows exactly where the guy is because you have to see him on camera to trigger this sequence, he always gets the drop on you and kills you. And there's no tutorial at all for how this sequence works, so it's on you to figure out that you can still turn and interact with stuff. Gotta go around real carefully, figure out what in the heck I'm missing... Oh great. The game has locked up to where I can't move or click anymore. To beat this section, you have to use a tracking device that Victoria fished out of her phone so that Hawker doesn't catch you. But the device can only be planted in one unmarked spot of one unmarked tank in one unmarked screen. Because the game hates you. And Hawker finally snuffs it. Sad day. The game doesn't let you plunge either of your pocket knives into any of the killers to make sure that they're dead. Game's not over yet, though, because now it's time to save Hernandez while Hawker goes full jigsaw with a videotape explaining the final trap. It's another electric chair. Dude, get some fresh material. And the game wants so badly for this to be a Hello Zep moment that the game's one creepy track starts blaring and drowning out the villain's speech. I can't join you for the finale, Vic, my dear partner. You betrayed me. Are you going to let- Now here's where things get kinda interesting. All damn game Hawker's been leaving messages for you of only one chance, you're only going to get one chance, and in his big speech they just break the fourth wall and spell out what that means. If this were a video game, I'd program it so that you couldn't go back and try again. Did you hear me? You only have one chance to save me, McPherson. Only one chance. Cripes, I get it! And the ultimate final uber puzzle of pure destiny that they hype through the entire game? Is one of the easiest puzzles in the game. You click a box on the floor and they outright tell you what to do. Shoot the box open, cut some insulation to jam the circuit, and then cut Hernandez free. That's it. The only hard part, again, is the interface because the hotspots that you need to click are minuscule and hidden. The interface is a bigger threat to you than the serial killer! Anyway, this is the signature feature that the game was so damn proud of. If you somehow fail the puzzle to save Hernandez, you get a bad ending where she dies and it's implied that Victoria commits suicide. The game then bricks all of your save files 
so that no matter what you do, trying to access the final puzzles makes the game skip straight to the bad ending. That's a great selling gimmick! A permadeath mechanic that locks you out of the good ending because the shit exploration and user interface screwed you! You can undo the bricking by entering a code on the main menu, and the code is Veronica Lake, the name of an actress that the killer is obsessed with. That's not terribly difficult to figure out, but it is kind of a leap, since Hawker's the final threat, but I thought Carson was the one obsessed with old movies. If you save Hernandez, there's a final bomb puzzle where the only tricky part is getting a lock combination from a hawker's wrecked phone by plugging it into one really specific computer with a cable that you found in the end game. What does it say that that's one of the tamer puzzles in this drek? Victoria and Hernandez escape, but Victoria has a sad that so many people died and she gets pissed at Hernandez wanting to do a story to wring some ray of good out of the tragedy because the game can only end by further wallowing in its own misery. Good lord, I did not expect the unofficial Saw fan game to make the actual Saw games look good! Still Life 2 is a horrid, tedious excuse for a video game. I get that fans are rightfully pissed that they not only ignored the plot of the first game, they outright destroyed it, but that's only the beginning of the game's problems. Top to bottom, the game is a chore to play with a needlessly finicky interface, a boneheaded inventory system, and a CSI mechanic that could have been fun if they hadn't run it into the ground. The game gets boring for long stretches as you're just confined to this one house going over the same rooms a hundred times each while the plot just kind of stalls out. There are no fun or interesting characters with even the immensely likable lead from the last game reduced to brooding milk toast. And for a script that wants so hard to be Saw, it missed everything that makes Saw compelling. Flat leads, a boring villain with a dumb motivation, no tension to the detective plot, and lame-ass traps. Just poison gas rooms and an electric chair over and over again. The moral of the story is that you never throw out the ideas that got you attention or compromise the entire identity of your franchise to chase trends. You're not fooling anyone, and without fail, you'll just be a pale imitation of the thing you're copying. Just like you, coming in here ripping off the Jigsaw bit from my Saw reviews! Who's here for Jigsaw? I just wanted some time with the waifu. Take care, and tell her thanks for the memories. There we go, I got you, sweetie. Oh. You feel strange. As if someone had been continuously groping your chest for the past nine hours straight. I wanted to use this clip from the first still life, but couldn't find a place for it. Gus seems to be having some problems in his older age.